thank you all uh, uh, for being here. Uh, Emmanuel, your last name, I mean, it's, it's Kaplan. Kaplan? Is that? that that's fine. Yes. That? Yeah, Kaplan from, from Sayons. Uh, you're joining us from Sayons. Did I, did I pronounce that correctly? <laughs> Almost. Sayon. Sayon. Sayon, French. My wife is a French speaker here, uh, she's one who studied French uh, studies. And, um, uh, she's been trying to teach me French for 30 years. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing we both know English and Spanish, so we can communicate. Um, uh, also with us uh, from California is Susan Moser of uh, Susan Moser Research and Consulting. Uh, thank you for joining us, Susan. Absolutely, it's a pleasure. And Richard Heinberg. Uh, I was telling Richard uh, uh, before the, uh, the call that I've been following his work in particular at the uh, Post Carbon Institute for many years. And, um, so Richard, thank you for joining us, a senior fellow at the, uh, at the PCI. It's a pleasure to be with all you folks. <clears throat> um, God, I mean, how do we approach a subject like this? I mean, we're here to talk about and pretty much to celebrate and, and, and uh, the film that Emmanuel, uh, uh, I think you wrote, directed, and produced, right? I mean, it's, you pretty much uh, put yeah. this film together. Still, still um, directing uh, it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's yeah, not. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> But if we can, if we can start, if you can just give us a uh, an update on the timing, when is it coming out? Um, what's what can we anticipate in terms of the timing uh, of the uh, of the release of the film? Uh, we're planning for uh, 2019, no matter what, and hopefully spring 2019. Um, we're doing the biggest piece of the, of editing next month, starting in May. Uh, for a month and a half with two editors and so uh, three three months worth of editing is going to happen then mm. and based on that we'll know if we have any uh, gaping holes that we need to uh, fill or if we're pretty much set and then we'll move on to the rest of post-production which is a lot of uh, music sound uh, uh, work and um, as well as uh, archival uh, work. So uh, there is still a lot of post-production, but basically most of the filming uh, has been done. And now we're, uh, we're trying to fund that last big chunk of the, of the process. Well, good luck with that. And, and it's an important film. Uh, anybody who sees the trailer gets a sense of that. And so again, congratulations for, uh, for, uh, for this piece of work. Uh, um, and in the email uh, conversation before uh, that led up to this um, uh, call, we said we would kind of have a conversation as if we were sitting around having some wine. And yeah, I'm, I'm only having a, a glass of water. I don't know what okay. happened. Uh, you know, the deal <laughs> with we all get a glass of wine. <laughs> that probably would have been so cool, right? And, and so we, we missed that opportunity. <laughs> Uh, but again, it's the spirit. It's the spirit of the wine. If we can just imagine it, <laughs> right, right here. Um, uh, but I did want to start with the title of the movie. It's it's called Once You Know, and uh, and the the, the, the trailer kind of teases us into what that means. So I just wanted to throw the out Once You Know What. And I want to start with Richard, because uh, Richard, you mentioned in the um, uh, in the trailer that. You know, uh, this, you call it toxic knowledge, right? You call it, um, you know, once, in fact, the, 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 the phrase once you know is actually uttered by you in the trailer um, where you say that once you know, you can never be the same. And so once you know what, what is it that <laughs> folks are going to discover in the, uh, in the film that answers that question? Uh, well, <clears throat> You know, the, the, there's a, a book that's just out right now by Steven Pinker that talks about how uh, everything's getting better and better. You know, we have uh, more energy at our fingertips than ever before. Uh, levels of interpersonal violence are lower than they've been in recorded history. Uh, higher levels of education, just about everything that, that we want uh, is, is, you know, if you measure it, it's, it's getting better and it's, it's about as good as it's ever been. The, the trick is how we're achieving this is to extract Earth's resources, turn them into waste, and dump that waste into oceans and atmosphere at rates that uh, are in, increasing 
and that you know will ultimately be paid for by future generations. So we're achieving this short-term, you know, civilization boom at the expense of the rest of the biosphere, the other creatures on Earth, and future generations. So we're in, it's, it's like we're in a bubble. You know, if, if you know anything about finance, there are these situations, manias, where everybody invests in, in something, whether it's tulip bulbs or the stock market, and drives prices up to unsustainable levels, and then suddenly the bottom falls out of the market and the bubble bursts. Well, this is like the history's biggest bubble. <laughs> and it's not just a stock market bubble, it's, it's an everything bubble because we've, uh, everything is part of it. Our food system, our uh, population levels, uh, the, the whole economy, the way we've designed the economy, it, it literally has no future. And once you really get that, once you understand that this is, this is how we've achieved all of this, and really there's no, no other way out than to, you know, completely redesign the whole thing, which no one seems interested in doing, it, it changes your perspective on just about everything. Yeah, now, and, and Susie is, uh, uh, comes out in the, uh, in the trailer saying that, in fact, I'm gonna read it, it says, to know what I know is unbearable. Um, so what is it that you know that is unbearable, uh, Susie? I know what Richard knows, <laughs> at least some of it. I don't know, I don't have that many books behind me right now. But yes, I do know a little bit about that too. Um, I work on climate change all the time and, and you know, to really understand sort of the systemic nature of how we are changing the climate and everything that depends on it. Uh, that, you know, all life, all human activity is in one way or another by climate change. And to think that what we have been used to for maybe the better part of, you know, 5,000, 10,000 years to be upset particularly the last 300 years in which we have built up this incredible modern machinery that we live on. That to me is a staggering prospect. Um, Richard calls it the toxic knowledge. I, you know, either I disagree with it or I think of it in a symbolic way, interpret that word in a symbolic way. When you take in a toxic, toxic, either outright kills you or blowing kills you. And I think what needs to be killed is this assumption in that we live by that we can have everything without limit, without disregard for, without regard for other species, the earth systems that we live in, the limits that we live in, and needs to die. That is toxic knowledge, and that is the one that needs to go. Um, and I think running into the limits of the earth system as we are currently in the prospect of, or in the process of doing, that is what will confront us with those old perspectives. And, you know, and it is incredibly difficult knowledge to hold um, because there will be lots of suffering involved, especially for um, many, many people who had nothing to, or very little contribution in, in uh, comparatively in creating this situation. Um, and it pains me greatly to, to think of the injustice uh, involved in it. But the fact that we are finally being confronted with those false beliefs about the unlimited abilities we have, that to me is actually good news. We need to shift away from that. That is, there is no future as Richard just said. Um, and if we want to have one, those deeply held beliefs need to go. Yeah. Woo, that is, uh, that is quite a, uh, a truth. And when you say that it's unbearable, in fact, uh, Emmanuel, you call it the uh, uh, you, you kind of uh, hint at your own journey uh, in the trailer uh, when you mentioned that uh, your worried mind spoils it all for you, right? I mean, it's, you know, we're all, we're all in this because we are burdened by this concern. We are burdened by this angst, by this worry. Uh, uh, well, we call it toxic or unbearable uh, or all of the above. Uh, but in your case, Emmanuel, uh, and, and if you can just run us briefly through that journey that led up to this film 
and how that worry that was spoiling it all or that's still spoiling it all, um, you know, is, is working out for you. Um, that's, I'm going to try to be good at making it short, the journey. <laughs> um, I've uh, always been sensitive to um, environmental issues from the way I grew up and the, the way my, my parents raised me. And I, I, I lived between Paris and, and the countryside near Paris. And so very early on, I had the sensibility to these issues, and it led me to study those issues later on um, when I moved to the States and, um, and actually study environmental sciences at McGill University in Canada and, um, uh, among others, climate sciences. And those things slowly became more and more uh, um, concrete for me. Um, and, and by that time, I, was, I started trying out different ways of being responsible and doing my part, as we say. And um, uh, this is how the film will actually begin, is with this series of, of very um, typical things that you can do for, for the environment. So, you know, I, went, I became vegetarian when I was 14 and um, did all kinds of, of, of things. I, I, when I came back to live in the States after being in Canada, for a year, uh, I lived off of uh, dumpster uh, diving. So you dive in dumpsters and eat the food from dumpsters that's being wasted by um, our food system. Um, and it, there was so much waste, you could actually just pick the organic stuff. Um, <laughs> that was, well, if you want a good address, Andronico's in downtown Berkeley mm -hmm. is a really good place to dumpster dive. And, um, you know, the, there, you know, that we had a, we would go to the chocolate factory and the bread factory and we had different addresses. Anyway, uh, you know, I tried to, to, as far as I could to go and do my part to reduce my impact. But it's, it was very much influenced by an individualistic way of seeing things, uh, which I guess was also an influence from, from living in the United States where we, we try to see what we can do as individuals. And now that I'm back in Europe, um, I'm, I'm going through that process again, but more from a... Um, uh, collective um, perspective and, and trying to blend both. And so the film starts with, okay, I try to do my part, but I'm also pretty um, scientific in, in, in the way I think. And I, you know, if I do the math and I add up all I've tried doing and I've done much more than a lot of people, it doesn't add up. It, we're, still, we're still going for that dead end so, uh, or that cliff or whatever you want to call it. Um, or, or getting off, the, off track. And so um, the movie starts there with that recognition. Uh, once you know that whatever you're doing to feel better about yourself or your conscience isn't enough, then what do you actually do? And what, and do you just give up or do you turn to uh, other solutions? What type of solutions? You have, obviously have the, technic the technical, technical solutions, the behavioral solutions, political solutions so it's it's really really an exploration of all of that with that um i think both susie and richard said it very correctly uh with that recognition that at the heart of it it's about um re uh, integrating limits um what richard was saying made me think of um it's like a group of people are getting drunk and it's all very nice and getting they're getting dizzy and it's a lot of fun and, and, and everything is so um um they're in this trance and this is what we're in we're, we're all really drunk off of modern uh, uh, uh progress and it's great as long as we don't know that there is a hangover afterwards uh as long as we don't know once you know there is a hangover is is, is really what the film is about so you know that the hangover is coming, but it's kind of a strange thing because you're not there yet. You're still drunk and having fun with everybody around you and everybody doesn't seem to be minding, uh, but you know that it's gonna come and you're not gonna be the only one paying the cost of getting drunk. Some people who haven't been getting drunk are going to be also hangover. And the cost of that is extremely high. And so it's, it's, it's um, basically the journey has been exploring different ways of um, being responsible for um, uh, my own uh, uh, way of living, but also um, the one of the people who I wish were here who isn't is one of the characters, Salim, uh, who, thank you, Susie, again, who introduced me to Salim because they worked together, uh, I think, uh, 
to the IPCC process, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. um, is, is, is he's both uh, working as a scientist, but he's also a negotiator um, through the COP process, so the um, United Nations um, series of conferences on climate change to help us find some way to, to uh, uh, come to a common uh, uh, route, I should say, or plan for dealing with climate change. And he's been there since the very beginning. And so in the film, he really addresses that question. And, and so um, what the journey has been, I, would, I should bring it back to the film, has been trying to find people like Susie, like Richard, like Salim, <coughs> like Hervé, uh, uh, climatologist in France, who um, uh, kind of uh, embody uh, a certain moment uh, in my life or a certain uh, set of ideas that I'm trying to develop and, 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 and share, not just on a uh, factual level, but on an emotional level and, and um, I guess a more profound and more humane um, um, level, uh, what, uh, what that means uh, to, to try to integrate. I, lo I love Susie's expression to hold the tension so between the knowledge uh, and, and, and what do you do with it? You just drop it or you hold the tension and what, do you, what comes out of that tension? I don't know if I'm yeah. being very articulate. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, absolutely. And, and not, not just articulate, very uh, powerful uh, emotionally. And again, for those of us, I think, uh, I, you know, the, the, uh, the four of us in this uh, uh, meeting, this call, uh, feel it. This is the reason why we're here. Uh, again, when I saw that uh, trailer, it you know it threw me back uh, to when I began uh, thinking about the unthinkable and and facing up. I think it is Salim, in fact, in the trailer that talks about um, you know the fact that we cannot. It's it's so uncharted this territory that no one really has a good hold on on what's coming and what's going to happen. And so we. You know, we talk to scientists and, and, and we read and we talk to each other and we, we're all a guessing game here in terms of what's going to happen really uh, in the future that we need to prepare for. And uh, we have right now with all these cities and all these companies preparing for this future and no one really seems to have a really good grip and handle on what that future is. And it is that uncertainty, that fundamental you know, restlessness uh, uh, of dealing with this today in the present that uh, that is the source of this angst of, of, of it's really what we have a difficult time uh, bearing to use um, uh, Susie's word and you just mentioned something that also comes out in the film uh, in the uh, in the trailer um, what does it mean right I mean in the search for meaning within this context and uh, uh, I think Richard you mentioned in the film that this forces us into a reassessment. And so how do you kind of reconcile this new search for meaning in this process, uh, while at the same time kind of reassessing, reassessing what? What, what is it that you mean uh, when you mention that there's a need for reassessing uh, when you tie it into the challenge of finding meaning in all of this? Right. Well, I think uh, it, at a certain level, it, it forces us to, this tension forces us to choose sides. I mean, in, in a sense, civilization is at war with the planet. And, um, and once you really get that civilization is going to lose, <laughs> ultimately, uh, I mean, the, the, not that the planet is, is going to come through this unscathed, far from it. Uh, there, there will be massive uh, destruction of ecosystems and loss of species and so on. But the, the end result is, you know, civilization is not going to prevail in this. Uh, if, if, the, if the more the planet suffers, the more civilization will ultimately suffer. So uh, this this change of perspective, in a way, is 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 like choosing sides and saying, well, hey, you know, I'm on the planet's side, um, and even though none of us could could live without civilization for more than you know 
few days, maybe a month, maybe a couple of months if, if we have some, uh, some survival skills. Um, the, the reality is, you know, that uh, this, this, this tension has to be resolved ultimately in the planet's favor. And, uh, and, you know, the best way for that to happen would be to transform civilization so that it's no longer uh, killing the planet, so that it's not a, a, a linear economy that extracts and pollutes, but a circular economy that, uh, that, that, that doesn't uh, cause climate change and, and resource depletion and all the rest. But... <clears throat> Ultimately, you know, we, I think we have to, we have, I, I have to speak for myself. I'm, I'm on the side of the planet. And that, that informs every thought, every decision, every choice uh, that one makes from that point on. Yeah, no question about that. Now, that could, I add a, could I add a word to that? Sure. I was just um, intrigued by your framing of the question of, you know, this very challenging state of uncertainty that we're in. Um, and it, it strikes me as, you know, we always interpret uncertainty as, as something negative. Um, I think it's fabulous that we're already uncertain. <laughs> it means we have already lost grip of the certainty that the old is good and the old is working and the old is fine. You know, you have to let go of these old convictions to some degree to be and, and maybe be forced to let go of them in order to become open to reconsidering in the first place, to even exploring something different. And I think this is where Emmanuel was saying, you know, holding the tension. It's the tension between the old that we knew and something we don't even know yet, or maybe between the tension that Richard just laid out, which is the tension between society being fully in control and dominating the natural world versus the natural world dominating us. It is the tension between the two. that We don't know what is the right new emergence out of that. You know, what is our new stance? I mean, imagine, put yourself in the foot of a, of a I don't know, a city planner, you know, mm -hmm. who has just been, maybe had a city destroyed or faces sea level rise coming up on them. They're not going to say, you know, nature take over. That's not the answer. That's not a realistic answer. It's the tension between those two opposites out of that we need to not maybe, you know, uh, decide easily in black and white fashion, but like, what does it actually mean to live in a more harmonious um, synergy between the two? What new things does that demand of us? What new behaviors, what new policies would constitute that? What new institutions do we need? And I think that's the, the not knowing, not know, having the answer for that. That is a, a reductive uncertainty. I love the fact that we are uncertain. It's uncomfortable to the end point of unbearable, <laughs> but it's a really important one. That uh, suggests a way of making peace with what you call in the, in the trailer, you call it on, on the way down. Uh, Emmanuel mm -hmm. calls it collapse. And so, you know, Richard calls it the end of civilization. So we're looking at, at different ways of really phrasing the same thing, aren't we? We're saying there's a collapse uh, happening, coming. There's a way down, as you call it in the trailer. And we have to make peace with it somehow. We have to reconcile it with who we are, with our reality, with, with what we're going to do. And, and uh, and find uh, the positive, find the hope uh, in it, um, uh, find the meaning in it, right? And so, um, uh, Emmanuel, when you talk about uh, collapse and collapse thinking and collapse mode, um, tell us more. I mean, what, what do you mean by kind of this embrace of collapse uh, and, and how to deal with that? Well, the, the first collapse is a really interesting word because um, there is a, a, a thinker in France who, who calls it um, a, a grenade word. It, it explodes in your mind in very different ways, depending, depending on who you are and your own life experiences. You know, it explodes in my head in a certain way. You know, maybe I have images of Mad Max or maybe I have images 
of something completely different. Maybe I have images of something that's a very slow process because I, I studied some of it through books that um, kind of complexified and gave nuance to it. Somebody else's might, you know, have some other Hollywood movie images com come to mind or maybe uh, something completely different, you know. So collapse is, a, is an interesting and dangerous word because it means so many things to so many people. Um, and, it's, and it's a violent word. It's a grenade. It explodes in your mind. So, but um, you, you chose to use it in the... I chose to use it because it you is... You chose to use it yes. prominently in the, in the film, yeah. Yes, yes. Because, because that's part of the process. Is the film started out as a film um, with, on the subject of climate change because um, um, there is something uh, kind of absolute about it. You know, but it's so global and um, the inertia and the human systems that are fueling it is so great. Uh, that amidst all this uncertainty, what's for sure is that there are certain thresholds that um, we're going to, at least that's my, uh, I guess I should say maybe a conviction, that um, even though we, there will be uh, lots of um, unpredictable changes, um, that there is also this great movement forward uh, of humanity as a whole, and that that is very slow to stop. Um, and so uh, I say collapse, but really the word should be more like the way I see it, the way it explodes in my mind, is more like crumbling because it's like a like a cookie. It's it's a very slow process. Uh, uh, maybe there are some moments where we identify moments. <laughs> for some people, it could be the election of the American president. For some people, it might be other things that are like very symbolic of like something is going wrong. But um, to me, you know, it's not that highly symbolic. So you know, it, it's it's really. How do you live as a biological species that lives on a very short time span, the process of a, a civilization going through the end of a, of a civilizational cycle, which to us, you know, is, is um, you could say is, you know, 200, 300 years. If you just look at the time we became a, a, a fossil fuel civilization or fossil fueled civilization, but you could also say that it's a much you know, longer civilization, the way the process became, how we became global through um, European colonization. And so, so the fact that it's crumbling or that it's collapsing is a very, very slow thing. And so we're not, we don't experience it like Puerto Rico did or like Richard's neighbor did when all the houses in the neighborhoods just northeast of his house burnt a few months back. Um, they're not, you know, you mentioned in your email, uh, how are you going to react when these isolated things become kind of like our idea of apocalypse, that we have fires everywhere and we have hurricanes everywhere. For me, it's not that way. To me, it's more a slow rise in, in the temperatures will decrease agricultural yields. And so it's more pressure on agriculture and how we feed our humanity. And so it's, they're not these very kind of striking thing. It's, it's a much more deluded, uh, elusive thing. Uh, and that's, so that's, when I say collapse, it sounds grand, but it's actually uh, maybe closer to what Susie calls a, a way down. It's something that's, that has many facets, yeah. but it's not a Hollywood movie. Yeah, it's a bit more nuanced than just, you know, sudden ending. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I, I wonder um, if it's a bit. Of, I wonder if it's a bit of both, though, because here we are. There are only four of us here on this screen who are talking, and at least two of us I know have been through a uh, a mass disaster. I don't know, it, Emmanuel or Susie, if if you have, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, Salim, mass... Salim Salim did just a few month a month or two before after you. Uh, no. biggest, biggest monsoon season since the 80s in, in, um, in Bangladesh, uh, 4,000 dead. So this wow. is becoming much more common. I mean, more and more of us have, can, can look back in our lives and say, yeah, I, I've been through at least one mass disaster where basically, you know, no electricity, thing, nothing works, uh, <clears throat> emergency services, hopefully, if that. And, uh, and, and people are, are just living day to day on, you know, what, whatever food they have stored and, and so on. And, and that, I think that really teaches you something about the, the fragility of, of the whole system. And I, I, I learned lots of lessons from going through the, the wildfires of, uh, of Santa Rosa in October 2017. Um, some, some of them were 
you know, really useful kinds of, of lessons that I can reflect back on and use in, in talks and, and so on. And a lot of them were just really disturbing and, and uh, oh my gosh, you know, I, I didn't know that. It's gonna, this, is, uh, this makes things more complicated. That uh, those, those wildfires are, are as apocalyptic as climate change can get. I mean, it's, it's those images, those visuals, those families coming back and seeing the entire neighborhood just burnt down. Uh, uh, it's truly, truly uh, disturbing and gut wrenching, as uh, as you say. But it also brings us back to another point that uh, that is brought out uh, in the trailer, uh, which is really what I would call the centrality of place, right? And so, um, you know, I know in your case, Richard, you you you've done a lot of work at at, uh, at the Post Carbon Institute on community resilience, and right. it always comes down to that community level, uh, and. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about resilience being so local, right? I mean, you have to really, you know, deal with it where you live. And, um, and so when we, when we address this issue of meaning, of finding hope, of finding, you know, some kind of, of, of light uh, in the middle of this, um, uh, at that local level, what do, you, what, what, do you, what do you teach, what do you tell your uh, uh, people when you address those local communities and, and, uh, and, 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 and tied into what we know when we know once you know. <laughs> so <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you bring that to that level, the community? Uh... Well, there, there are a lot of good reasons for working at the community level. One is that you, you can meet people face to face and that helps get beyond a lot of the political stereotypes that are bedeviling us these days, particularly in the United States, but I know in, in many other countries as well. Uh, if, you, if you think of people as, as abstractions in terms of political parties and leaders and so on, then it's really easy to tune out people's humanity and the, and the, the possibilities and opportunities for, for engaging at, at, at a real human level. And, uh, that's actually one of the things that that the that disaster teaches too i mean uh if if you're in a disaster you don't care whether your neighbors are democrats or republicans or christians or atheists you're all in the same boat and if you if you don't help each other out you're going to be in a very leaky boat uh so people tend to to do exactly that help each other out and and it, it really is uh, uh, quite an amazing experience to be in, in a situation where, you know, people who never live on the same block, never spoken to each other, suddenly, you know, everybody's getting together and emptying their fridges. There's no electricity anyway, so all that food has to be eaten. And having a big, you know, block party and, you know, turning, turning disaster into, um, into festival. <laughs> Uh, that's actually that's actually it's interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting cue for uh, for Susie because Susie in the uh, in the trailer you mentioned something that really struck me. It's just really, you know, and it's on, in in that same line of thinking uh, when you say that we have to meet each other in that vulnerability and mm -hmm. and become more alive. Uh, so that's a quote that I'm reading here from my notes and and so. Uh, I really wanted to ask about that. I mean, when you when you talk about meeting each other in that vulnerability that Richard just described, um, tell us more. I mean, what do you, what do you what do you mean? Well, it ties right back to what you just previously what we previously talked about, which is the you know, we've just been struck um, by a disaster. We're as equally unprotected, at least in this very moment. Um, we're in the same situation. We don't have, we don't have electricity. We don't have any place to go. Maybe we don't have shelter. Um, you know, these are incredibly intimate moments of revealing how we are so not in control of our lives. And to be able to then trust your neighbor, your community, um, to come together and provide a sometimes physical shelter, but I would almost call it an emotional shelter for your grief, for your loss, for your sadness, for your fears, for your uncertainties. That to me is an incredibly important moment. Um, 
it happens on a regular basis in these times needs it works a lot better when if richard had met all his neighbors before i'm sure it would have been even you know more uh young <laughs> to come together and and celebrate in that moment or to come and share that particular moment um when we have those trust relationships um it helps when we have these trust relationships to our leaders in our local governments in our agencies with whom we now need to interact and have um profound and difficult interactions of how how to rebuild you know we talk about resilience as or you just framed it as something that is very local in fact what we know from you know both social studies as well as from ecological studies is no ecosystem is an island in order for ecosystems to reconfigure after a disruptive event there always is influx from outside you still need water coming in you still need species and seas and what not to come in and in the same way this is true for rebuilding a, a social community after it's been wiped out by a fire or a flood you need government you need economy you need um you know funding uh donation whatever all the rest of it that comes in so our dependency is actually much broader much wider than the immediate neighbors they're they're absolutely essential but i think we need to recognize that our dependence is much bigger um including on the things that you know get shipped in from the other side of the country i just recently was talking to uh firefighters who think of themselves as as on a national bucket brigade in other words you know if something happens in puerto rico um the Floridians go across you know the strait to to help the their neighbors and then people from Texas go over to Florida and people from California go to Texas to help so basically there is a you know ripple effect across the entire nation in which we support each other and i think this is maybe the the most encouraging interpretation if you will of the word apocalypse if if you go back to its original meaning it actually stands for a a form of revelation we reveal something both of what's broken and what we need and what possibilities there are for the new so apocalypse with you know i'm not diminishing in any way it's it's horrific nature but there is this moment in which we can become aware of the alternative values that could guide how we want to rebuild so if we rebuild with a consciousness of we are dependent on nature on each other on functional governments then what does that mean for how we want to re reconstitute ourselves after a disruption like that to me those are the important questions and very difficult to ask in a, in the moment of disaster because the human impulse is to get back to normal as quickly as possible so now is the time to ask the question of how do we want to rebuild if and when we get struck by a disaster no doubt um and in fact it 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 applies also between disasters or when there is no disaster going on doesn't it uh, you know this Absolutely. idea of, of meeting each other in our vulnerability that vulnerability is is now 365 24/7 all the time uh from now on you know uh until the end of times and and so if we if we approach your idea of um of um you know maybe you know if, if we want to like uh, reuse or if we frame the 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 use of the word ap- apocalypse uh uh that would be a, an excellent way of uh, of doing it but um but again it's it's about approaching each other it's about meeting each other in that vulnerability and being together uh and that normally happens again that normally happens in your neighborhood in your community in your city um uh, now emmanuel uh, i know you know you wrote uh, um uh, uh i don't recall if you wrote it in one of the emails or if you say it in the in the trailer but but you come back to your village and you talk about your village um uh and i i'm not going to say it again cuz i'm not going to pronounce it uh i'm not going to pronounce it well and uh, say yon <laughs> there you go so um you call it interesting you call uh, you call it a place of interesting conversation of of uh and i looked it up you only have a thousand people uh in that uh village in that city it's a small town so um you know for those of us kind of more used or accustomed to living in these big cities where it's a lot more impersonal 
with making these these human scale connections, uh, you know, it's it's more difficult, or or if not more difficult, it's not done as much as um, where you're from. So, how much solace, how much comfort does place bring to you there in that community? How much of that mutual vulnerability, connection, community? Um, do you live on a daily basis or do you see others living? Um, I, I, th I think to start this, my answer, I'll, I'll um, go back to what Richard was saying. Uh, at, at some point, you need to take sides and this is where the film is more political um, uh, and it's in depicting this village life and the kind of people who, who've landed here, who've chosen this place um, not because they're born there, but because of affinity to, to the place. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people who arrived in this village uh, over the years, uh, recently, and I've been here for seven years now, um, have made a common uh, choice. Um, and it's to live closer to the earth, you know, so back to the land, you know, we've tried it already in the 70s. It wasn't incredibly successful. I mean, there are a few successes, but... Um, so I think the generation that's doing it now, at least I speak in my name, um, are doing it with um, once they know. So they're not doing it with the same um, imagination uh, that the first wave of Back to the Land did it. They're doing it with a lot more lucidity as to the limits of what's possible. And... Um, more in a, uh, we'll call them to make it to simplify, we'll call them transitioners. They're trying to transition to a, to a more circular economy, to a more local, relocalized economy. And I'm finding out that a lot of people who are here uh, have the same um, goal, personal goal, famil family goal. And it's, it's very, the solace you spoke of is, is very real. It's very true to know that there are people around me who are tr in that same movement trying to live out um, and be, be true to themselves and to their, their deep um, intuition because they're, you can never know the future. That's, you know, it's, that's, the, that's the, the problem and the, and the, the good part of, of uncertainty is you, you never know really what's going to happen. You might have a good hint. And so intuition comes into end. And so all these people who are here, there's this common intuition. It's not all, but it's, it's quite present. And, uh, and that's, that's very exciting to know that you're not alone. Uh, and that's one, one of the things, one of the first things that, that Susie also told me in the, first, the first day we met and we interviewed, uh, we did the interview the same day. It was meant now uh, three, four years back, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you're not alone. You're not alone. And that's really, that's, I would say, the or one of the most important things uh, I'm pursuing with this film is I want many people like you, Alex, and others who are suffering or deal, having to deal with this individually, uh, who can meet other and hear uh, other people who have gone through or are going through a similar process and who also offer, um, you know, some, I wouldn't say solutions, but some ways of holding that tension. And, um, and I think community is a huge, huge part of it. And when we're preparing for the, this meeting, I told you, it's not just about the future and the uncertainty and the once you know what's going to happen, it's also about what's happening right now. And place brings you back to the now. And uh, I, you can't see it right now. And I don't think it would be very useful me turning the computer around, but I'm facing this beautiful mountain. I'm 200 meters above sea level and there's this mountain that's uh, 1,500 meters just above us. This huge rock that's always reminding me of that very, we're very small. <laughs> And, um, and it's changing every day, and it's fantastic to see it change. It was yesterday, it was beautiful yeah. weather, and today it's snowy, it's full of snow again. And it's, so it's about um, a, a lot of uh, um, place has, has this incredible capacity to embody and make real these um, uh, ideas uh, that we are, these, these these religious ideas or, or philosophical ideas about life, you know, about the importance of being the present and the importance of uh, um, 
our, our relationships to each other and trying to you know, write codes of how we should behave with each other. All these things, they happen in the community uh, at very experimental, experiential level every day. Um, and uh, today we, we just, we just uh, recorded a, a song that I, I fell in love by uh, going to uh, one of the local, there's a local bar, uh, um, uh, collectively um, organized and kind of self-organized. And they had a, they were celebrating their six year anniversary and there was a concert and I, I heard friends of mine playing this music that no, they were preparing for based on a poem by the French um, poet, uh, Arthur Rimbaud, Arthur Rimbaud. And, uh, and, I, and I said, we have to record this song. It has to be in the movie. <laughs> Why? Because, um, because this song is called Ma, Ma Bohème, My Bohemia is really about um, youthful, um, romantic uh, being in the present and being and living on the road and on the roads and, and this kind of very exciting moment of youth that I feel that I've, that I've lost um, that my worried, my worried mind that I talk about. And, and, and that song is going to be in the film at a moment where we're all together and there's a lot of community feeling um, in that scene uh, and, and community brings me back to that carelessness or carefreeness and um, and to the fact that, hey, life is still beautiful, I'm still alive, and there's still uh, uh, amazing biodiversity um, still in the world. And, and, you know, we're here all discussing uh, that we're suffering from something that's going to happen, but we're not the, vic the actual victims, you know, or you might have been, you know, and, and Richard could have been. Um, but uh, we're here. We're not the, the, the real ones that, you know, we're just... We're just talking. We're not experiencing it yeah. in the flesh. And so that's also this, I think, why I want to talk about it, because it feels that it's, there's nothing to complain about. You know, if people have, other people are having a much harder time right now. Uh, so, you know, why, why should I, you know, talk about my echo anxieties? And I think uh, the film wants to give permission to people to say that, no, it's a very real thing. It's a real condition and it's spreading to a lot of people. And it's insidious because it's happening very, very slowly. You know, one hurricane at a time, people are getting more anxious and we need to recognize that. Uh, uh, Susie, tension. you got to jump in there. You got yes. to jump into that, Susie, and, and like react. Uh, that was a beautiful uh, statement. And I just wanted, if I, if I may ask you to tie it into um, your work on transformative resilience and kind of explain what that is and, and where that's going. And, uh, uh, but, but tied into to this uh, really emotional, inspiring approach to this way down or to this collapse, what Emmanuel <laughs> just, uh, just stated. I just want to say, I'm not sure I'm going to have a lot of followers <laughs> to be excited about the way down. Um, <laughs> but to be, I, to be fair, to be fair with Susie, in the interview, she, after saying that, she says, "Or on the way up, depending on how you see it." Ah, there you go. Right. Okay. Well, so, so for me, you know, yeah, the transformative. Here's your chance, Susie, to clear that up. <laughs> well, the transformative process has a way down and a way up, right? And a lot of time in between when we're we don't know where we are. And I think you know this experience that that Emmanuel just described of being both completely distressed about what he knows and having these islands of solace, these islands of of absolute joy and and you know uh, peace of mind. I think that's a reality too. And and those, I mean, that's the reality of the time that we live in the tension between those two. Both are true at the same time. While we're having the most fabulous conversation, somebody else is getting killed. Somebody, you know, that's, that too is, tr is, is simply true. Um, sometimes in the same place, sometimes far apart from each other, but we have these simultaneous truths. And to me, there are all these opportunities to, well, we all need reprieve once in a while from the distressing experiences. I can only imagine in Puerto Rico um, how you get through every day. I mean, you know, you have to deal with the, the horrendous after effect and the lack of recovery and recovery. 
and then you just meet your neighbor and you give them a big hug and it's wonderful. And, you know, or you observe, I don't know, two butterflies playing in a, or two kids playing or, or something like that. And, you know, it's these moments of reprieve um, that I'm sure are just true in Napa and Sonoma as they are in, in Puerto Rico and in a place with, um, and then we turn around, you know, another piece of news comes in, you just wonder, um, <laughs> you know, we have just lost something else that used to be the system that, you know, was for many of us a good life. And I, and I just want to say what we might consider, you know, a, a wonderful civilization and with all the the criteria that um, Richard cited earlier from this new book that's just out, that has never been uniformly experienced across the world, right? We have done that in the back of millions of people who have suffered enslaved labor, um, people who have lived next to toxic waste dumps um, or refineries and breathed awful air just so the rest of us could have a wonderful privileged life. So there's something not all that new for me about the simultaneity of awfulness and and beautiful moments or, or you know really amazing moments um and we need them thank god they're there they're you know they give us ideas and, and open our imagination to the seeds of the new that are possible but i don't think and this is maybe the you know <laughs> i'm sort of stimulated by this idea of a grenade in our minds you know really important to find language to describe the way down um, in ways that capture the full range of our experiences in that. I mean, the fact that we can go through, like Richard described, and still have festival in our streets, right? I mean, that was the word you chose, Richard. That to me is, that shows us something about the potential of humanity. And to me, that is rich. Therein lies hope. That that we are capable of that full range. So let's open up our imagination and think of how could we come out of this transformative process and you know what's what is it that we, we need to bring forward out of our human nature that is actually conducive to life. I recently, maybe a three months or nine months ago or something like that, gave a talk that was entitled, If It Is Life We Want, right? Life in all the many meanings that we could imagine. If it is life that we want, then what do we need to bring forward out of our human nature? Creativity and our problem-solving skills, our abilities to imagine better worlds and make them possible, that affirm life, not just human life, but life for all beings, I mean, what would that bring forth in us? I think that could be amazing. I don't think we humans are even close to having exhausted all we could be. We've you know, pretty much exhausted our nasty side. We pretty much have <laughs> laid out what's possible there, thank you very much. And now there is this other side of us that I think we could do a lot with it. To me, that is the true hope about how going through this very difficult time might bring us to a life worthy, a livable and feasible future and a really exciting one at that, a creative one. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And you know, what comes out of our nature, uh, you ask and, and, um, and the other challenge is, is as you say, uh, uh, making that global, uh, really extending that, extending that to as many people, as many places uh, as possible. Since we know we're all capable of it, we live it on many occasions, even in the midst of disaster, uh, uh, to then extend it when we don't have necessarily a disaster going on in, in our uh, community and, and just, you know, transform, just really transform uh, um, you know, our approach and our mindset um, as we, you know, dive in. Um, now, there's one thing that, uh, that I did want to ask about, um, um, and it comes back, Richard, to 
um, the work of, of the Post Harvard Institute on the six foundations of community resilience, right? And uh, the sixth one is really interesting, it's courage. And so in the middle of all of this and just hearing uh, uh, just Emmanuel now and, and Susie and, and again, what comes out of our nature, right? And um, I, I mean, clearly, you know, if, if there's one thing that has to come out in this process uh, along with the creativity, along with the meaning and, and, and uh, it's courage. Um, uh, so I did want to ask you to address that and kind of like give us a bit of, uh, of your take on, on why that became the sick foundation of resilience that uh, that you've been working on there uh, at the institute, because uh, uh, it's it's a compelling idea that that we need courage in addition to beauty, poetry, uh, positivity, uh, perspective. Well, it's it's courage to to keep going in the in the face of uh, adversity and and the potential for breakdown of systems around us. It's also the, the courage to say things that are, are very unpopular because what, what we're talking about doing is not just making, it, it is not making our current systems more resilient so that, you know, the current ways we produce food and do transportation and so on uh, can continue long into the future. Um, these things need to be transformed and a lot of people don't, you know, are, are, would like to keep things the way they are, um, wh whether it's in our local community or on the global scale. So uh, a lot of the courage is, is the courage to, to, you know, be constantly saying, no, 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 that's, <laughs> that's not going to work. We have to do things differently. And, uh, um, and it's not, not always yeah. a comfortable uh, place to be in. That is correct. That is correct. And on that note, uh, we have really run past our time. I just yeah. want to thank you all so much for uh, being part of this conversation, which, uh, again, it's hopefully the first of many. Um, uh, Emmanuel, again, uh, best of luck on, on the rest of the process in the movie. Uh, we look forward to it uh, uh, next year. Uh, it's going to be... Um, of great impact, and it's going to make a fantastic contribution to the world. So, <laughs> you well, and if it comes out, it comes out, and if, if you can help it come out by funding it, <laughs> you I'm making my call. Um, we're, All right, we're uh, being uh, we're doing a, uh, a fundraiser through uh, the San Francisco Film Society, uh, SF Film, uh, and they have a web page where uh, you can donate, but maybe uh, you can forward that information along with uh, Absolutely. Good. Once you know. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Have a thank good day. You. Thank you.